a one yeah so we'll be talking today about uh, representation learning of and, uh, and uh, generative learning using auto encoding gans so if anybody has any questions uh, while i was uh, going through the first nine uh, 18 slides uh, uh, for 17 slides uh, just raise your hand and let me know uh, but for the but for the last four slides uh, just uh, hold on uh, if any doubts are there like uh, i'll try to clear after the four slides because uh, the four slides are uh, uh, pretty interactive like one information that you, which you might have missed in one slide might come in the other so uh, for the for, for those four slides just uh, uh, hold a bit yeah uh, so uh, this chapter is about representation learning and generative uh, generative learning using auto and quarters and GANs. Uh, and in the previous uh, session, we learned a lot about GANs. But uh, one thing uh, that Hopi actually pointed out in the previous session is that uh, auto and quarters and GANs are actually uh, a bit similar. Uh, not, not a bit similar, they are a lot similar in nature. Uh, but the only thing that changes them uh, is the way they, the, the networks are interacted actually. Uh, so let's uh, go into the contents. First thing is like, what are GANs and what are autoencoders and why why are they, those two different? And autoencoders, there are different types of autoencoders. Uh, these are the different types of autoencoders which we'll be discussing about. And there are uh, other different types of autoencoders that which you might encounter in real life, but are not here. Uh, the only reason that which I did not include them is that because uh, this chapter 17 does not have them. So, uh, but we'll, we'll try to cover uh, if possible that, those things also. And the next one is GANs. Uh, uh, in GANs, like uh, what are GANs first? And why are GANs actually difficult to train deep convolution GANs, progressive growing GANs on style GANs? Uh, the progressive growing GANs on style GANs are a bit uh, tricky in nature. So uh, we'll dive deep into the architecture and how the style vector is being incorporated and how the progressive going growing GANs are actually growing. So it, sorry, it's progressive. That's a spelling mistake. So uh, auto for auto encoders, uh, uh, the, the uh, let let's actually uh, auto encode. Uh, uh, let's actually see how auto encoders work. So let's suppose if we are trying to remember a sequence, uh, which starts with ten uh, and eight, six, four, two, and zero. And if uh, any human wants to remember it, uh, we actually will not remember uh, 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, and 0. Uh, because this is a sequence of six uh, characters, uh, we actually can remember those six characters. But what if we have 60 characters from 120 to 0, 120, 118, uh, 116, and so on and so forth? Uh, we might not actually remember the whole uh, uh, sequence. But thing is, uh, we can actually uh, 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 remember the way sequence has been constructed. So we can remember that the starting is 10 and the ending is zero. And the difference between every unit is two. So in that manner, uh, uh, however the however long the sequence is, uh, let's suppose this is uh, 60 uh, different 60 character sequence or so 60 different points. Even though the given data is 60 different points, we actually can capture the whole 60 points within three points here. So this is what autoencoders do. They try to remember a sequence a long sequence, whether it's a, a, a time series data, image data, or whatever it is. And they try to find a pattern in those sequence and they try to remember that sequence if possible. And that's that the, 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 the sequence they remember, in this case, uh, the 60 uh, uh, characters, we, we were able to remember it in three different characters. Uh, they, the, the, the number of characters should be uh, uh, drastically less. In this case, 60 uh, has been remembered with three. Uh, that is how uh, autoencoders work. Uh, this is uh, a general example of how autoencoders actually work. So let's see how what our autoencoders are. Uh, any questions here? Zach, so you were in uh, yesterday's lab meeting where there's a lot of people working on autoencoders, right? Mm -hmm. So could you maybe rephrase this again for in your understanding of what people are trying to do? Maybe give you an example. I mean, the, the way I've seen auto, I guess the most is in segmentation, um, like a unit where you have like the autoencoder that shrinks the image down essentially, and then builds it back up 
for the segmented bask back up is how I understand it. So I guess it's being used to remember or find the really important features and then uh, decoder will eventually, uh, once you find those features, um, reconstruct the image. Can continue. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, what Zach said is exactly true. So in this case, we're trying to remember this sequence. Uh, 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 here is the auto encoding, and then reconstructing the sequence from these points is uh, uh, the decoder sequence. So, so yeah, uh, the uh, why do we use auto encoders actually? Uh, is because uh, it encodes the input uh, input data in the lower dimensions. Uh, just as I uh, mentioned here, uh, whatever the length of sequence, we try to find a pattern in the sequence and we try to remember the pattern rather than the sequence itself. Uh, and this is unsupervised learning algorithm. So uh, one thing we have to understand is that in auto encoders, while when we have a sequence, uh, the encoded part of the sequence is not given to us. It is learned by the uh, the encoder network, so it is uh, unsupervised learning, and it contains two different networks. One is uh, encoder and a decoder. <laughs> Uh, and they, these auto encoders can also be generative in nature, but the results are poor uh, in most cases, and we'll see why uh, this happens. Uh, so this is uh, this is a general structure of uh, an auto encoder. So we have an original input. Uh, let's say this is an image in this case. Uh, this will be given to an encoder. So uh, let's say this uh, image is two fifty six by two fifty six, and this. Uh, encoder converts the original uh, image, which is shown by two to six, into an encoded representation or latent representation, which is represented by H in this case. And this H uh, will be uh, 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 around uh, 16 by uh, one or something of that sort, which will be very less than uh, the input dimensions, the input image dimensions. And we'll and the next thing is that we should be able to reconstruct the image or the original data from this latent representations using something called decoder. So if you remember the earlier example I gave where we have original input as sequence, we're trying to remember the, the, the encoder, what it tries to do is, it tries to remember the pattern in the sequence and it doesn't remember the sequence itself, but uh, uh, encodes the pattern here. And from this pattern, we'll be able to decode the original image using something called decoder. So those are the two uh, uh, main uh, things that we should know. Encoder captures the uh, patterns, decoder uh, creates the original image from the patterns. So the next thing is that uh, we, we want to see is uh, the types of auto encoders. And the types of auto encoders actually are a bit intuitive in nature, like uh, they are not, uh, if, if, uh, if it is read once, uh, like they can be, uh, we can understand the gist of it. Uh, but I just want to uh, take a two minutes and just cover them simply. Uh, so the first one is a uh, linear auto encoder. Uh, this is the simplest form of an auto encoder, uh, and it only uses linear activation function, and no other layers are used. So uh, in a linear auto encoder, what happens is uh, there's an image, and the auto encoder will be just one single uh, layer of a uh, network. Uh, this single layer of network uh, uh, will be used uh, to encode. And a linear activation function will be used for the uh, for encoding, and the decoder will also be a single uh, network. When I say single network, I didn't mean single node, but it is single uh, a layer of network. Imagine that. And because uh, we are actually using linear activation function, uh, uh, the functions uh, the the loss function here will be uh, uh, um, RMSC or MSC. And if you uh, remember what PCA is. This actually performs PCA, uh, principal component analysis, uh, where it tries to reduce uh, the uh, the dimensions of the original data into lower dimensions uh, and capturing mo most of the information uh, by wherever the variance is more. So uh, a linear autoencoder actually uh, is the simplest form of uh, autoencoder, and it basically does what PCA does actually. And the example here uh, we can see is to project a 3D image into a 2D image. And the code for this part uh, for linear auto encoder, uh, it was uh, mentioned in the book. Uh, I did not include the code here. And stacked auto encoders, the next one. Uh, 
the only di difference between a linear auto encoder and stack auto encoder is uh, the number of layers in the encoder and decoder architecture. And yeah, uh, one thing that uh, we should not forget, uh, which I did not mention or which I did not write here is uh, the encoder and decoder usually have a similar architecture, not the same architecture, but a similar architecture, but reverse in nature. So if encoder actually is using a convolution layer, uh, decoder will be using a convolution transpose layer. If uh, 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 whatever encoder does, decoder actually have to do the opposite uh, operation of it. Uh, so uh, imagine this, like we have uh, two phase by two phase six here, we have a couple of convolutions and then uh, reducing the image and so on and so forth. Here, we will try to upsample the image, expand the image, and then we'll have uh, two convolution uh, transpose layers. So that is one thing to be remembered. Uh, and the only difference between linear and stacked out encoders is a number of uh, uh, layers in the encoders and decoder architecture. Uh, in linear auto encoder, we discussed that uh, the encoder and decoder will be a single layer uh, neural network. It's not a single no neural network, but a single layer neural network. But stacked auto encoders, the name itself says multiple uh, 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 layers were stacked together to form an encoder uh, and in a similar manner multiple layers were stacked together to uh, uh, create uh, the decoder architecture also. So the main uh, uh, idea is that if, if we have more uh, uh, layers of uh, networks, we can uh, capture more complex patterns from the data. And uh, if, you, uh, if, if, you, if you intuitively remember like what neural network is and how they work, uh, the linear autoencoders are named linear because they cannot actually capture nonlinearity in the data because one layer of neural network uh, uh, cannot capture nonlinearity, uh, whereas stacked neural networks uh, will be able to capture nonlinear patterns in the data also. Uh, and one thing is uh, the number of auto encodings uh, will be used, will not be something uh, fixed in nature. Uh, it can be uh, anything, usually uh, two power, uh, a value of two power, uh, like 16, 32 or 64. Uh, but it has to be chosen uh, as a parameter. Uh, the examples of stacked data encoders are like uh, uh, MNIST, reconstruction of MNIST. This example actually is a stacked data encoder. So this is a, a, a stacked data encoder architecture uh, where we have uh, some input layer, uh, a hidden uh, 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 unit, uh, some hidden units. And the next one, this one uh, is the encodings. Uh, after two hidden units, whatever we have, this is the encodings. And the, the next hidden layer, this way, is this part actually is the uh, encoder. And okay. after the encodings, we have uh, our decoder. And decoder actually decodes the, uh, 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 the pattern and recreates the origin of. Uh, the way actually we train these uh, uh, auto encoders uh, in real life actually is. Uh, we actually have an input input layer. Uh, we do something and create the output layer, and we see how different the output layer is from the input layer, because the idea is to reconstruct the original image. So if the the only thing we'll check actually there is whether we are reconstructing the original image or not, and if you are not reconstructing the original image properly, then we say that something has to be changed in the weights of these neural networks, and that actually is the back propagation. That's how the back propagation works. The loss here is the difference between input and output layer, and we'll calculate it however we want. If it's just vectors, we can have to even vectorial distances. Uh, if it's images, we have 2D vector distance, something of that sort. So this this is how we calculate. Uh, 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 this is how the back forward propagation and backward propagation occurs in auto encoders. Uh, any questions here? Okay. So. Yeah, more more of the auto encoder types. Uh, simple thing is uh, remember this: uh, if there is something that which has been added in front of the auto encoders, so here it says a convolution auto encoder, and the next one is a recurrent auto encoder. So the intuitive the, the intuitive uh, way of understanding this is if an auto encoder actually has the if an auto encoder in a sense any of the encoder or decoder architecture has a convolution layer in it, it's convolution auto encoder. I know it sounds stupid, but uh, they just gave it as type support encoders, uh, which is usually uh, how we use because we don't use uh, the linear auto encoder or uh, the stack auto encoder in most of the cases. Uh, we'll be using these kind of these different things. Uh, so the auto encoder with convolution layers, typically, which is used for images and small sequences. Uh, 
the encoder actually has a regular CNN to downsample the image and reduce its size. That's what CNN does. But the decoder has to do the reverse of CNN and upsample the image and reduce its depth to the original dimension. So uh, if you uh, 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 if, if you have ever actually uh, ripped open a CNN, uh, you understand that uh, CNN actually has this uh, all sampling layers where we try to reduce the, uh, the uh, activation map of the image to lower dimensions. That is what encoder does to capture the pattern. The decoder is the opposite, where we have a smaller uh, uh, activation map. It tries to upsample the activation map to recreate the image. Uh, in uh, Kiras, we can achieve this uh, CNN by using the CON 2D or CON 1D network. Uh, the reverse CNN uh, is given by uh, CON 1D, CON 1D transpose or CON 2D transpose. Uh, we have those uh, uh, written all, already in TensorFlow and Kira. So we can use those. Uh, yeah, in a similar manner, if an autoencode actually has a recurrent uh, uh, layer, recurrent layer in the sense any of our RNN, uh, LSTM, uh, GNN, something of that sort, any kind of recurrent architectures, uh, those are called recurrent autoencoders. And these recurrent autoencoders are usually uh, used to handle time series on sequential data, just text and time series data. Uh, we have discussed uh, in depth about the recurrent layers, so I'm not going in deep about this. Uh, but similar to our uh, convolution layers, RNN and reverse RNN uh, are, are used to build the other recurrent autoencoders. In the encoder part of the recurrent autoencoder, we'll be using a simple RNN or LSTM. Uh, but in the uh, decoder part, uh, a reverse RNN or reverse, uh, reverse LSTM should be used. Uh, in Kira's and TensorFlow, we have uh, something called repeat vector on time distributed layers for the same thing which uh, does the opposite of RNNs. Yeah, these two are the uh, the uh, very uh, kind of uh, enthusiastic parts about the types of autoencoders, if, if you ask me. Uh, one thing is uh, denoising autoencoders. So uh, we saw that uh, in, the, in this map, we have an import, we are encoding and decoding, but we are not saying how we are encoding it. Uh, we are actually giving it uh, to our neural network neural networks are usually black boxes. So we want them to learn the pattern and encode the features simply. So that is how we are assuming it is to be done. Uh, in uh, denoising autoencoders, uh, we actually add something and that is noise. And the reason we add noise is that uh, in C when the CNNs are originally trained, uh, 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 if you see, uh, the original examples are uh, MNIST uh, and the next is cats and dogs. Uh, if you remember, like uh, in cats and dogs, for uh, example, uh, in the first trained uh, examples of cats and dogs, uh, when they are trained, if a cat has been trained as cat perfectly, and if the cat has been added some noise and trained again, then it is actually given, the probability actually shifts a lot, which should not happen because if we don't want uh, the, uh, the convolution uh, or the whole layer uh, to exactly fit the data. So, in, in, in denoising autoencoders, what we do is the input of autoencoder is introduced along with some noise and trained to recover the original noise-free inputs. So imagine this as uh, we, you, you have a, 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 a very noisy image and you want to reconstruct the original image from a noisy image. So this denoising autoencoders will be helpful in dark cases. And while building the denoising autoencoders in real life, we actually uh, can use one thing as Gaussian noise and the other thing is we can just add dropout layers to introduce noise because in dropout layers, uh, if you're introducing dropout layers, uh, then we are actually uh, blacking out some part of the uh, uh, the whole sequence, the input sequence. So uh, a denoising autoencoders can be achieved by using these two in real life. One is to add Gaussian noise uh, and the other one is to add dropout layers. So actually in uh, in real world, whenever we are training something, whenever we are training an encoder or uh, an decoder, we actually always try to uh, incorporate our uh, dropout layers uh, because we don't want uh, uh, overfitting of uh, the, uh, we don't want the encoder to overfit uh, on the given uh, input sequence. And the idea, the idea of the denoising autoencoders actually was introduced by Yan Likun and he introduced in his master's thesis. Uh, actually, that means the autoencoders are even older than we imagined. Uh, so, in all the above examples, denoising autoencoders, a recurrent convolution, or uh, linear and stack, uh, we give an image, we get, we do, uh, we encode the image, or we encode the input, we get something as called latent representation or encodings, from which we decode. 
this changes in the variational autoencoders. The basic structure of variational autoencoders is actually same as that of autoencoders, usual autoencoders with an encoder and decoder architecture, architecture. But instead of directly producing the code, the, directly producing the latent representations or encodings for a given input, the encoder produces a mean encoding and a standard deviation encoding. So yeah, this is uh, uh, this is an example of a uh, variation auto encoder. So this is the input sequence of uh, this. Let's suppose hidden one and hidden two. There are some other layers, and the, let's call it an encoder. The encoder does not produce one vector saying that okay, this is the encoding. Use that decoder. Use this to uh, uh, do something uh, uh, to reconstruct the image. No, it doesn't give one encoding. It gives two encodings. One actually is the standard deviation of the encodings, and the other one is the mean of the encodings. And what decoder now has to do is it actually has to, the actual encoding is sampled from a Gaussian distribution of the decoder uh, and the decoder we use it to recreate the image. So uh, in statistics, if you, if you remember, like if you have mean and standard deviation, then we can actually pick a point and the point will change. The point will vary uh, when you, whenever you run it again. So that is the reason these are, these are called variation not encoders. Uh, the encoder part doesn't uh, 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 get affected much. Uh, because uh, the only thing it is doing is it's creating a different or a different encoding. Uh, but after this, you have to pick uh, or the decoder actually has to pick mean and this, uh, and standard deviation and pick a point. Uh, imagine this is a latent space uh, where we have uh, a mean and a standard deviation of three, let's suppose. So now if you are picking one point in the given uh, 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 with the given mean and standard deviation, Let's suppose uh, you are zero and three is a standard deviation. Let's suppose you are picking 1.5 and you are, by picking 1.5, you are trying to reconstruct the image or the input sequence from that 1.5 space. Now let's suppose you are rerunning the very short encoder and the mean is same zero and the uh, standard deviation is three. Now the chance of you picking is one of, of 1.5 is low. You might pick actually some other thing like, uh, because the uh, standard deviation is three, you can pick 0 0.7. You have to reconstruct the original input from 0.7. The thing we have to understand is that uh, this actually, uh, what, what we are trying to do is for one input, there can be a lot of outputs that, that are reconstructed actually, depending upon the, the way you pick uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, latent spaces from this mean and uh, standard deviation of encodings, the output changes, but the changes will be very less minute in nature. Uh, any questions until here? So this actually is the uh, whole point of autoencoders. Uh, autoencoders. Uh, the main things we have to remember while uh, talking about autoencoders is that uh, there are two architectures in autoencoders. One is encoder architecture and the other one is equal architecture, which are mostly similar in nature. And uh, basically what we are trying to do is uh, dimensional reduction actually. Uh, we are trying to reduce the dimensions of the uh, 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 input image into some small dimensions. And we try to reconstruct the uh, original image from the smaller uh, uh, dimensions. So that is the auto encoder. That is a whole part point of auto encoders. But if you remember, like I said, that auto encoders can be generative in nature, but the results are poor in most cases. Uh, so if you uh, think about it now, after the, all the information I gave, you, you should actually have an intuition about this last point. Uh, because once, let's say that uh, you are actually given a chest image, just X-ray image here, uh, and you did some encoding, you did some, you got some uh, little features, and you try to decode it and create, reconstruct the uh, chest X-ray image. Because of the loss function uh, and uh, the the stochastic nature of the uh, network on uh, neural network training, the original input will not be equal to the reconstructed uh, output uh, at any point of time, but you will have a small variation from the original input. So you'll be constructing a text text image that which will be not same as the original input, but a bit different in nature, a bit different in nature. So that is actually, we are creating, we are generating a new chest X-ray image if you think about it. So that that's how the auto encoders are actually generative in nature. But the when we say the results are poor, we say it because uh, the localized features uh, are not captured properly. So. Uh, yeah, in this case, four, it captures the shape of four. Uh, in a similar manner, uh, just, uh, suppose we give a chest X-ray, uh, it captures the the the, uh, the outbounds of the lung and the ribs and these things, 
but it won't capture uh, the some some of the fine grain details of the chest X-ray. So it generates, but uh, those generations are usually poor in nature. It actually captures high level features uh, rather than uh, capturing the lower level features. Uh, any questions here? Is that is that is that another distinction between autoencoders and GANs, right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, GANs. Uh, I'll go into it. Yeah, but what what I was trying to say is that autoencoders can also be generative in nature, uh, because they are actually trying to reconstruct the original image, but they won't be able to reconstruct the original image as it is. So they will be constructing the original image with some changes. So you are you are kind of now generating a new image, provided this uh, original image. Uh, did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Okay, yeah, good. Well, uh, any other questions? Okay, if we don't have any questions about autoencoders, uh, now let's uh, dive deep into uh, generative adversarial networks, GANs. Uh, so the word adversary means conflict or dispute. So uh, that actually gives the whole game here. So you are generating something by co creating conflict. Uh, that's the whole essence of GANs actually. So uh, GANs are a bit similar, into, similar uh, to autoencoders. Uh, if you remember in the autoencoders, we discussed that the important thing is that two layers, encoders and decoders. Uh, actually, in this case, what happens is the two neural networks in the autoencoders does not interact with each other. They won't share the weights. The only thing that autoencoder does is creates a latent space and decoder takes the encoding and creates the original image. So these two are not interacting with each other. GANs also uh, has two neural networks. One is called generator and the other one is called discriminator. We'll go deep into like what generator is, what it does, what discriminator is and what it does. Uh, not only these two neural networks interact, they are constantly pitted against each other to make themselves better. And they are actually of the same architecture. And before going any further into GANs, uh, uh, I'd like to say this like, uh, all the people actually in this uh, uh, in this meeting actually has created GANs. Even if you have created GANs or not created GANs, but uh, uh, if you think about it, you already have created GANs. And I'll give one example of that. If anybody actually has ever run a classification model, they have created a discriminator model. Any classification model, if you, are, if you have created a classification model to identify races from just X-rays or as even uh, cats and dogs, you are discriminating there. You are creating a discriminator such that uh, uh, provided a given uh, prov uh, provided given something uh, supervised, you are trying to uh, point uh, the class classes uh, for each data point. So you are trying to create a discriminator in that case. So anybody who created a classification model created a discriminator, and the first, the very first machine learning model anybody actually has launched is linear and logic regression. After that, we learn something called naive bias uh, 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 regressor or, na or naive bias classifier, which actually uses uh, uh, a chain probability model, uh, Markov, uh, Markov chain model to create or, or to, uh, yeah, to create data points. That actually is a simple generator. That's, that's, the, that's the simplest form of generator. So if you have ever worked on naive bias model or some generative model, and the classification model, you actually have created a GAN, but the only thing is that you do not connect both of them. Questions here? Uh, got a point in chat. In GANs, uh, please, how does the two neural networks interact with each other if they are trained differently? Yeah, I, I, I'll go into the training part. When I say interact with each other, I, don't, I do not mean that they share weights in some measure, some, some kind of thing. Uh, but I'll explain like what I mean with interact with each other. So uh, the intuition behind creating GANs is uh, in simpler terms, uh, a generator takes a random distribution as input uh, from latent space, let's say that should be a noise uh, thing and modifies the distribution, the, this random distribution to create a fake data point. Uh, generator does what it does, it creates something which is sent to the discriminator to test whether the data point is real or fake. And the generator is actually penalized for not being able to fold this generator. So uh, uh, imagine this. Uh, so let's now let's imagine that we, we are training actually a GAN now. 
So the generator actually takes a random distribution and it creates some fake data point and it is sent to a discriminator. And the discriminator actually has to classify whether the data point is real or fake. So that means that the discriminator should be trained priorly, right? Because it actually has to classify right now, but we are not doing it here. So I'll explain that point also. And the generator is penalized for not being able to fool the discriminator. If the discriminator finds this as a fake image, then that will be uh, the loss. Then, then that will increase the loss of generator actually. So if the generator can't fold discriminator, uh, the loss increases. So to reduce the gap in the loss, the generator tries to reduce the loss gap and it tries to create an image that which will be, which the discriminator will not be able to identify. So the training process is a bit different. The GANs are trained a bit differently than the original neural networks or any kind of a network actually. Uh, in original networks, if uh, we are training a CNN, uh, 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 LSTM, or even a BERT or encoder or something of that sort, uh, we actually have some data. Uh, uh, we actually have those labels. And then we uh, give this, we try to find a pattern between the input data and output data on the labels. That is how we actually train uh, other neural networks. But uh, GANs are trained in two different phases. And uh, I actually wrote a phase zero because uh, I thought something is missing in phase one and phase two. Uh, the phase zero is uh, we actually generate some images using the generator model. So in this case, we are not bothering in the phase two, we are not bothering anything about discriminator actually. We take some, uh, uh, we take some noise, we take some latent space, point and latent space, uh, and we uh, give it to generator and generator does what it does, generate something. Uh, that is the phase zero and the weights of discriminator are untouched. So we are not doing anything to do with the discriminator. And in the phase one, we first train the discriminator first. And the discriminator, uh, the spelling is wrong, I guess here, I don't know. The discriminator actually is given a batch of real images, which means the original images and a batch of fake images that which the generator actually uh, got in the phase zero. And they were actually given as real images were, uh, were given as one, the label is given as one. And the fake images that the generator created, we don't know whether those are real or whether those are actually looking real or fake, but we label them as fake because we know that they are fake. We, we label them as the, the, them as zero and train them for one step using a binary, binary cross, entropy, uh, cross entropy loss and weights of generator are untouched in this, uh, uh, in, this uh, in this phase of training. So in phase zero, only generator has been trained to generate fake uh, images. Phase two, only fa uh, uh, the discriminator has been trained uh, without uh, touching the generator. So in phase zero and phase two, we are not, uh, we are creating two different, different neural networks, but these two different neural networks are not talking to each other or not doing anything. Uh, generator is doing something and discriminator is just discriminating it. But not, 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 no information flow is being uh, 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 is, is happening between the discriminator and generator. That is what happens in phase two. So in phase two, what uh, uh, generator, uh, we actually try to train the generator. We repeat the phase zero. Phase zero is to create some fake images uh, and label them now actually as ones. Though we know that they are, are fake, we label them as one and ask the discriminator to classify. So in this, what happens is, so let's suppose uh, 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 first the phase zero happened, we generated some fakes, uh, fake images, uh, fake data points. Uh, you know, the discriminator actually was given those uh, uh, original and uh, fake data points. The discriminator has been trained for one step. Uh, remember this, it has been only trained one step. And now these two are actually uh, uh, pitted against each other. So uh, uh, the generator, the, the discriminator says, okay, generator, uh, you, you uh, created some images, but those are kind of shitty in nature. So here is uh, the loss function to you. Here is a loss uh, for you. And the now what the generator does is it takes the loss and it does the phase zero again. It creates an image. It creates again images such that it reduces the loss given by the discriminator. And now the generator actually does the same thing. It gives the discriminator the th th these images. And now the discriminator actually has to find again the same thing. And now the discriminator creates a loss again that which has been propagated to the uh, generator and the generator again creates images and so on and so forth. This uh, 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 game runs uh, for a long time. 
uh, until they reach some point where the channel actually creates a real images. Uh, uh, Toby, did I answer the question about interaction? The interaction, what I was talking about is that the transfer of this, this uh, the loss from discriminator to uh, 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 generator. In the auto encoders and decoders, in auto encoders part where we have uh, uh, encoder and decoder, the encoder or decoder are not uh, transferring uh, uh, anything. They, the, 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 uh, the encoder creates uh, 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 encoding uh, representation and the decoder takes it and goes away. That's it. It's not uh, uh, coming back to say that, okay, this is stupid, something of that sort. Uh, did, I, did I answer the question? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, yeah, if you remember, if you if you if you if you think about this, uh, uh, the GANs, the whole process of GANs, uh, this actually is a, a kind of a two-player game, uh, where uh, one player, let's suppose the police in, in this case, uh, I'll give an example, police, uh, the first one, uh, uh, the discriminator is police, uh, the generator is uh, is a thief, where the thief is trying to generate some counterfeit uh, money. Uh, the police now have actually to, uh, actually has to capture the counterfeit money. If it doesn't capture the, if the police doesn't capture the counterfeit money, then the counterfeit money, the generator uh, all, always creates this uh, uh, counterfeit money uh, uh, as he likes. Uh, but if the uh, police captures the image, uh, the counterfeit, now the thief actually has a new task that he has to create counterfeit money such that they are not the original money, but the cop will not be able to identify those. So he goes back. Okay, uh, he comes up with the new technology where he could create a, a new counterfeit bills that which the cop will not be able to identify. And now the cop will have to work that on that where he has to actually take those counterfeit money and check whether the money is co uh, counterfeit or uh, original. So if you, uh, this is actually a two, 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 uh, two sum game actually, or zero sum game with two players. So uh, one will be loser and one will be winner kind of thing which actually creates a lot of problems uh, and uh, uh, i'm not going deep into this because all of the people here are computer science students uh, I'm, i think i'm thinking only judy and myself are not computer science students uh, but this actually develop is uh, this actually has a name in game game uh, in uh, game theory and those are the difficulties in training games and the name i'm talking about is nash equilibrium so uh, 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 yeah, let's let's go to the example which we are, which I was uh, uh, taking. So we have two players uh, 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 A and B. Uh, so A, ha A, A A is actually coming up with uh, a certain pattern, and B is trying to beat the pattern that which A is creating. So in that manner, both A and B are actually creating new patterns, uh, uh, new uh, yeah, new patterns. Let's suppose they are creating very new patterns, but because this is a two sum game, because this is a two player game, there will be a point where there will be no more patterns left for A or B to create. So let's suppose this pattern actually is four uh, units in nature, like four uh, units length in nature. So for four units, two power, uh, two, uh, two power four, uh, which is 16, there are only 16 patterns that which can, which uh, these, uh, these two players can actually uh, take. And once the 16 uh, 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 patterns are taken, there are no more patterns where these two people can look for new patterns. So that is called Nash equilibrium. So no player would benefit by changing strategies provided an equilibrium is reached. So provided generator and discriminator are, are reached an equilibrium, no player, I mean, uh, the discriminator can, uh, won't benefit when it changes the, the, the uh, uh, generate the way it generates, if it does, the loss increases rather than decreasing. And the same happens for the discriminator also. That point, that point where no player cannot, no player can move from that point is called equilibrium. And in game theory, that is called Nash equilibrium. While training games, we have the same kind of issue. If the generator produces perfectly realistic images and the discriminator couldn't predict whether the images are real or fake, the same scenario happens because both actually reach their perfect points. The generator is perfectly uh, uh, creating uh, images and discriminator uh, could not predict. So that is the equilibrium we want, where we want to, we, we want uh, uh, generator to create images. 
So that equilibrium is called Nash equilibrium. And when that equilibrium reaches, uh, nothing happens. The weights are not changed. Uh, the losses, uh, the loss are transferred, but it doesn't do anything at all. So the trans, the uh, the transfer of weight stops, and the equilibrium, the uh, uh, the training process gets stuck there. Even when you are running for a lot of epochs after that, it doesn't happen anything. Nothing happens there. The equilibrium has been reached. That is one disadvantage of uh, uh, of this two sum game. Uh, any questions? Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going forward. I thought that's the whole point, right? Isn't the whole point for it to reach the equilibrium where nothing, where basically the discriminators content and the generators okay too? Uh, actually, uh, okay, sorry. I gave uh, a different example, wrong example, I guess here. So imagine this, okay, if this happens, then we are happy that the generator is producing realistic images and discriminator is not able to predict. But uh, let's suppose if the generator is not actually producing realistic images, it's producing some different kind of images, and uh, a discriminator is is not was not able to predict. I see. I see. You imagine the situation. So what's happening is the generator is not producing the images perfectly. Uh, it is producing some random images, but the discriminator is not able to catch it up. So now what happens? Because the discriminator is not able to uh, catch it up, the uh, uh, generator doesn't have any incentive to move forward at all. That that that, that is what I was trying to make the yeah. point. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and the next one is called mode collapse. Uh, and I did not write anything here because uh, I uh, uh, I wanted to explain this mode collapse in the way that which we discussed before, like the cop and counterfeit does uh, example. So. Uh, uh, mode collapse process uh, is actually a uh, is, is actually the first difficulty. The, the, the uh, in the Gans paper, uh, it has been discussed thoroughly. Uh, the first Gans paper in 2014. So what happens is, uh, uh, as we discussed, uh, thief is actually producing counterfeit bills, and the cop is actually uh, 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 trying to classify uh, whether the, whether the counterfeit bills are actually counterfeit or uh, original. Imagine a situation where uh, the cop actually gives up. Imagine a situation where the cop doesn't work anymore. He says, okay, I don't care what you are doing. I don't care uh, whether you are producing counterfeit bills or anything. If that happens, then the generator doesn't, uh, the, the, the generator, whatever the counterfeit bills it has been producing, it uses the same counterfeit, it produces the same counterfeit bills. It doesn't change anything at all. So in this two sum game, let's uh, imagine this as a hide and seek where the generator is hiding perfectly and the, the discriminator was not able to seek. So if the discriminator was not able to seek, the generator goes and hides in the same position at every given point of time and the discriminator won't be able to seek it, right? So the generator produces the same output again. So one thing that which is different between Nash equilibrium and mode collapse is even when the Nash equilibrium is reached, the generator produces some stupid images, some stupid images, some random stupid images. But in mode collapse, the generator doesn't produce some stupid random images. It produces the same image at any given point of time. Actually, if you uh, have listened to the JSON's presentation perfectly, JSON actually has actually given an example of mode collapse, where every, uh, uh, give me a minute, mode collapse example, I'm looking up on internet. So what happens is uh, when more collapse happens, uh, the generator produces the same image and that is not a realistic image. That is nowhere realistic in nature. But because the discriminator was not able to find that the, uh, that, that, that image actually is fake, the generator produces the same image at any given point of time and says, okay, this is the final image. I don't have to do anything because the discriminator is not actually able to uh, 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 see this and predict it as a fake image. So uh, that is uh, actually mode collapse. Uh, I'm trying to find some... In MNIST, this mode collapse happens and uh, uh, it will be actually funny because in MNIST, the whole point actually is to uh, create random numbers, but it creates an image which is no, which is not any number at all. 
uh, but uh, it stops training there. Uh, I'm trying to look up at that one actually. Come on, come on. Measuring more collapse. Okay, I'll come back to this. Uh, I'll show an example of more collapse. Uh, imagine that actually, uh, like in MNIST, we are trying to produce numbers, but the generator produces an image, which is not a number, but because the discriminator is not able to identify it as fake, it doesn't move. So every time, because the discriminator was not able to find this particular point in the whole latent space, every time this generator comes and hides at the same place. So that is, uh, you, whenever you, when you are even training uh, for a lot of things, uh, uh, for a lot of epochs, uh, when the mode collapse has been reached, the training usually stops. So that is, uh, th those are the main two difficulties in training GANs. Uh, okay, uh, before going into the next slide, which is DC GANs, uh, progressive GANs and so on and so forth, I want to ask like any questions under here. And if you have any questions from the, the last slide, please wait until the lab, please wait until the final slide. Okay, uh, I'll go forward. Uh, DC GANs, uh, the same, the uh, explanation actually is deep convolution GANs. Uh, so this is uh, uh, similar to autoencoders, convolution autoencoders, if you remember. Uh, so an autoencoder where there's a convolution, we call it convolution autoencoders. The same happens with GANs. Uh, if you are using a uh, convolution layers in the generator or uh, uh, in generator and discriminator, uh, we actually call it a deep convolution GANs, but there are small thing, things that are to be changed uh, because this actually is a deep convolution GAN uh, where we have actually, this is the uh, random noise, 100 dimensional random noise. And from this 100 dimensional random noise, we create a four by four into one, one zero two four and so on and so forth. Some convolutions are done, uh, 64 by 64 by three is generated finally as a generator image. But one thing that which we have to, uh, 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 I have to mention here is that the training of uh, uh, images uh, through GANs is actually unstable because uh, uh, because one thing is images are actually large uh, data points and here we uh, we take a hundred vectors and create sixty four by sixty four by three. So though the GANs paper actually was introduced uh, uh, using convolution layers uh, for training larger images, uh, this this process was unstable. And to make the process our uh, training process stable, the following guidelines were proposed. And this this guidelines, uh, I actually uh, went deep into uh, like how they work on these things. But one thing I don't understand is like why does these points make the GANs training stable, the deconvolution training stable? That I did not understand. And I mentioned it uh, in some unexplored portions. So. Uh, I don't have much explanation on DC GANs. Uh, the only thing I understood about DC GANs is that uh, when you're training convolutions, uh, GANs are unstable. So to make them stable, we do uh, we actually change some uh, small portions of generator. Uh, and one thing which you have to understand is like whatever the next things that are coming, uh, whatever the different kinds of GANs are coming, you have to understand that the only thing we can do is to improve generator or improve discriminator. Those are the only two things we can do because they are the those are the only two things in GANs. And to improve a discriminator, uh, it kind of in, is, is intuitive because discriminator is a classification model. So you have to build a better classification model every time, that's it. So a better classification model means a better discriminator, that's it. But for generator, generator, it's not that simple because we actually don't know what generator does. It's kind of a black box for us. I mean, even the discriminator con con uh, classification is a black box, but we can do something uh, to understand why those classes are being uh, created. But for generator, there is no such thing. So in all the next things, DC GANs, or, or, or progressive yoke drawing GANs, or style GANs, or cycle GANs, or whatever they are, the main difference is that we actually change the generator a lot. That is the only difference. So uh, let's park this for a second. I'll come back uh, to this again in the last slide. And this one is progressive going growing GANs. And I did not write anything because I wanted to show this. Yes. So uh, imagine that uh, uh, we are creating actually a, a, a large image, uh, 10 1024 by 1024 uh, image. 
uh, in that 1024 by 1024 image, uh, if you are trying to, uh, if you are, if you are going by the usual standards of GANs, so you take, uh, you take, you 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 take a, a random point in space, which is a noise, uh, and you try to create a 1024 by 1024 image, the generator tries to create, and the discriminator tells whether it's uh, real or fake, and so on, so on, so on thing happens, and this 1024 by 1024 image changes such that it is realistic in nature. That is what GANs are, but Progressive GANs doesn't allow you, allow you to do that. What progressive GANs say is, the name itself says, they progressively grow, progressively growing GANs. So what they do is, they take the, uh, the noise, whatever that, uh, uh, whatever the noise we gave, and it doesn't generate it to 1024 by 1024 image, but it generates a very small four by four image. The first thing that they do is a small four by four image. And the discriminator uh, should not be, uh, uh, the discriminator will now uh, actually get this four by four image. And now it has to decide whether that is a real or fake image. And provided that we could fool the discriminator at four by four stage, then we will move to a next stage. We'll progressively grow and create an eight by eight image. So the, the, I wanted to show this because this is how the thing happens. In generator, what happens is, so, so let's suppose we have a 16 by 16 image. And we are trying, then the next stage of growing is 32 by 32. So what happens is after the 16 by 16 image has been created, it will be upsampled, uh, uh, this simple upsampling uh, uh, and create two X of these things. So 16 by 16 is actually kind of stretched to make it look like a 32 by 32. But when it is stretched, the pixel points actually vary, right? So now when, the, when there are some pixel points uh, uh, that which are not actually uh, uh, pre-filled, we fill them with noise and give this to the generator again to generate the 32 by 32 image. So we are not directly creating a, a bigger image, but we are creating a smaller image and we'll, fill, we'll try to fool the discriminator from the smaller image. And once the discriminator has been fooled for the smaller image, now we create a, a bit bigger image, four by four, then the next eight by eight, eight by eight. And we'll try to fool the discriminator by eight by eight image. Next we grow to 16 by 16, 32 by 32, and so on and so forth. That's how we can create larger images with progressively growing GANs. So the only difference between progressively growing, growing GANs and uh, uh, the usual GANs is that the discriminator does not change. The discriminator remains constant. It's a classification algorithm, it remains constant. The only thing we change is the generator will not generate the whole image, but will try to generate smaller images and then grow the generator will try to grow the image uh, uh, at an exponential pace, uh, at a two power exponential pace. So that is what uh, the generator does. Uh, any questions? Okay. So this is focus a growing GANs and the next one is style GANs. Uh, yeah, and this is also uh, uh, a case style GANs actually uh, is not uh, is actually a different version of progressively growing GANs. Uh, if you if you let me to say that, it is built on top of progressively growing GANs. So all the progressively growing GANs things, whatever I explained that uh, that uh, it happens uh, by from four by four uh, to eight by eight by six to six by sixteen, uh, they grow. The, the generator grows the image. The same things happen uh, in style GANs also. Uh, and the same things happen in style GAN with the discriminator because in progressively growing GANs, the discriminator is not changing. In style GAN, the discriminator does not change. Now, in, but something different in, in the case of GANs is in the style GANs, is, the generator no longer takes a noise signal as input. Because if you remember in progressively going GANs or any other GANs, it takes a, a latent, uh, we, we call it a latent point in latent space. So we usually denote it as a noise image. Uh, and it takes a noise image and the generator does something on top of it uh, by uh, messing up with the distributions of the image, of the noise. But instead in this case, we have two new sources of randomness. Uh, one is a standalone mapping network and the other one is the usual noise layer. And the noise layer, we know it because it's uh, a point on latent space. It's very simple to understand but we don't know what mapping network actually is and why this is actually being given and what it does that will come next. The output of mapping network is the one that defines style at each point in the generator. Uh, so actually, give me a minute. I think in this case, yep, I have a paper.
Yep, yep, yep. So this is a tra traditional uh, progressively growing GANs. We take a latent uh, 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 space Z, we normalize it, the normalizing is nothing. And then we create a four by four by uh, doing some pixel normalization and convolution. We create a four by four. And after that, we upsample the four by four and we repeat the same process of convolutions and pixel normalization and we create an eight by eight and so on and so forth. This is how we create a traditional progressive growing GANs. But the style-based generator, what it does is, I told that the input, for the, the synthesis network, this is generator G, it actually is getting input from two things. One is, we can see the noise, and the other one is this thing called mapping network. These two are the inputs for this uh, uh, generator. And the way this generator, this mapping network is created actually is the same, take some noise, normalize it. And this normalized uh, noise now is given to a eight fully connected layer network. And this eight fully connected layer network actually gives uh, a, a space called W. And the, the, this W actually will, will, will actually now dictate the style, what style this, uh, 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 what style the generation should be. And the same thing happens if you see. And four by four, uh, we generate a small one and at, uh, eight by eight, we generate a different one. But there are some, some things in which we are forgetting here. Uh, I'm like, kind of skipping here. One thing is, there is a constant four by four by five twelve, uh, which is not pre present in anything. So you always uh, so the, the the input for actually synthesis which is generator is not latent noise here, which is actually the input for mapping network. But the generator actually takes a four by four by four by four by five twelve vector as input. That is the input for synthesis. And now for that uh, for that we actually add noise, and after the adding noise we create a style here. And the style is generated from this mapping network. This mapping network actually has eight fully connected layers. So to be to go to one throw. And this style is given to something called ADAIN. And I'll explain what ADAIN is. So uh, I'm pretty sure everybody here actually has heard about batch normalization, if not actually coded batch normalization. Uh, am I right? Yeah. We so, coded batch normalization. Okay, uh, Chima, can you tell me what batch normalization actually is? Oh, no, no, I'm not too sure, but I've used it with the image with the images before. Okay, uh, can anybody tell me what actually batch normalization is and what it does? Is it just a layer that will normalize based on like the standard deviation of, uh, I guess, the current mini batch? Exactly. So yeah, you are, you are perfectly right. So it takes the batch, uh, the mini batch uh, or batch, let's suppose it's 16 images. It takes the batch and it normalizes the images in that batch itself. So normalization actually uh, is a very simple mathematical uh, formula. Uh, it's uh, actually X by uh, mean by standard deviation of X, that's it. So it takes X, which is the batch here, and it creates the batch's mean and standard deviation. And what we do is uh, the batch point minus the mean batch point by standard deviation, point, standard deviation of the batch point. That is what BN, uh, batch normalization is. Here we have uh, ADN, ADAIN. ADAIN is actually uh, adaptive instance normalization. So in the similar manner of batch normalization, we have something called instance normalization. In batch normalization, as Zach pointed out, we are taking a batch of images or batch of data points, right? But for instance normalization, we don't take a batch, we take one instance and we instantly normalize it simply. So it's simple normalization, but because we have batch normalization, we call it instance normalization. In instance normalization, one thing we have to, uh, the only thing that changes is that we are not taking a batch of data points, but a single data point is called uh, 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 instance, instance, in, instance normalization. The normalization formal, formula doesn't change. It's uh, X minus mu of X by standard deviation of X. It's that simple. The same formula applies for uh, batch normalization and instance normalization, but Adaptive instance normalization not, does not take one input. Because in this case, you can see that the adaptive instance normalization actually is getting two things. One is uh, uh, the synthesis network actually has a constant image, which is an added with noise, and that is given. And the next one is the style is coming over. So adaptive instance normalization actually has two inputs now. Whereas the usual batch normalization or instance normalization has only one input, X. So what uh, adaptive instance normalization does is, it calculates the same for uh, the X, which is the noise here, but it actually multiplies the standard deviation of style and add the mean deviation of style to the original thing. 
So, so let's suppose uh, instance normalization is x minus mu x by standard deviation of x. That is a formula. Everybody knows it's normalization. The adaptive instance normalization will be uh, will be for x and y points, two points, which will be the same uh, x minus mu by uh, uh, x. This x minus mu by uh, uh, sigma uh, standard deviation sigma means uh, is multiplied by the standard deviation of y, which is psi. And this whole thing is added to the mean of uh, 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 the style. If you intuitively think about it, we are reversing it actually, because if you think about it like uh, uh, x minus mu, so we are minusing the uh, the mean and dividing the standard deviation. We are reversing it by multiplying the standard deviation and adding the mu. So we are trying to reconstruct the x point using a separate thing called y. So we are trying to what we are trying to do is we are trying to uh, 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 reconstruct the uh, the noise from style, the style vector. Uh, understood or is it confusing? Uh, yeah, it makes to... sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, cool. Uh, Chima, does it make sense? Toby? It's confusing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, let me take this. So, uh, so are we clear about the batch normalization and instance normalization? That thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, x, let's suppose the point uh, minus mean uh, by standard deviation of x. This is uh, the usual normalization. We know this, right? This is good. Yes. So what adoptive instance normalization does is it actually is getting two things, two different things here. Uh, go away. It is getting two different things, which is one thing is X, the same thing uh, 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 that has uh, noise. And the other one is if it's getting a style. What, the, because we have two points, we are actually uh, denoting it by uh, X and Y here. So the, the, the usuals remain the same. But now what we do is we multiply this by a standard deviation of y and add it with a mean of y. So now think about this. The usual mm, uh, x is divided by the standard deviation, actually. Then we are multiplying the standard deviation. So the, the, the intuition is that the multiplication actually cancels out the standard deviation. It doesn't cancel out. Remember, it doesn't cancel out but the intuition. So let's suppose if there are no x or y's, now think about it, sd by sd. Uh, sorry, uh, by SD into SD. So it, they both cancel out each other, right? So now then what we have is X minus mean plus mean. Now we are recreating X. Now get it? So we are trying to recreate X oh, from Y. The recreation won't be perfect because X and Y are not the same things. X is a noise thing yeah. and Y is a style thing. But we are trying to recreate X as a function of Y. Uh, am I clear here? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Probably, uh, Judy, is it clear? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is the adaptive instance normalization, actually. This is the formula of adaptive instance normalization. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to create, recreate X. The point of the whole generator thing is to recreate X. We are trying to recreate X as a function of Y. And this Y, because it's style, we are incorporating style vector to the original noise vector for recreation. That is the style gans completely. That is the whole gist of style gans actually. The only thing we have to understand is like, where does the style come from? Because the style, 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 this, there are a lot of styles here. Where does the style come from? This styles come from a mapping network. And uh, yeah, I'll go to the next slide to explain this. Actually not explain this. And I'll explain why I'm not explaining this also. Uh, so this is what happens. And in a similar manner of a, of a progressively going, growing GANs, we take noise and the style and we create a four by four image first and next upsample the image to eight by eight and recreate the eight by eight and so on and so forth. We'll be creating this, uh, 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 higher order images. The point of doing the style thing is, uh, if, you, if, you, if you remember there are, there, there, you, you actually have seen videos where, uh, uh, one photo is taken and uh, hairstyles are changed or mustaches are changed or something of that sort. 
in that case what happening is you are actually recreating one particular point one particular version of that image one particular point of that image whether it's hair or mustache or nose or skin tone or something of that sort you are taking only one one thing different right that one thing different is the one that which that style defines and this style actually in this case it's actually a a, a bit a uh, wrong i'd say here you say like a goes as style a goes as style but a a actually are true but for this thing it won't be a a it will be this will be a1 a1 this will be a2 a2 the style changes at every uh, for every different uh, of sampling for 4 by 4 the style will be a1 let's suppose for 8 by 8 it will be a2 and so on and so on and so forth so the style actually doesn't remain same it changes for every up sample image uh get what i am saying do you have a picture of like what the style uh uh gan actually is and how is it different from the progress gan yeah okay yeah. uh i'll try to make it easy now so these are the changes from uh the progressive gans the progressively growing gans uh, there are some changes uh that are done for style gans to make style gans from different from progressive gan growing gans that is one thing is a uh, bilinear upsampling uh, the bilinear upsampling uh, is uh in yeah 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 in this case uh, we are uh, directly uh, upsampling uh, from the nearest neighbor in this case for 8 by 8 4 by 4 is the nearest neighbor and we are directly upsampling uh, from 4 by 4 but uh, in this case though it is actually done as upsampling uh, we are directly not doing upsampling we are doing something called bilinear upsampling bilinear sampling which is implemented by a low pass filter and uh, this actually is mentioned in gans uh, in the style gans paper like how uh, this up upsampling does uh, and it's a, it's a bit signal processing uh, uh, heavy so i am not covering this here but i'll uh, but i'm uh, but i am interested in it and i learned it if anyone wants i can teach them that how that happens so the upsampling has been replaced by something called bilinear upsampling and the other one is mapping network and adaptive instance normalization instance normalization which i discussed now like what is adaptive instance normalization and uh, because adaptive instance normalization is not uh, in the progressively going gans and this mapping network uh, which creates the styles is not also in the progressive gans the next one is uh, the removal of latent point uh, so yeah this is something which is easily recognizable because in the latent the for, for generation uh, for the generator network the input here is a latent point space uh, z but here it's not a latent point space it's a constant 4 by 4 4, 4 by 4 by 4 4, 4 by 4 by 5 12 image or vector so that is the one thing that change the addition of noises yeah because in this case the noise is directly given we are not adding noise here but in this case the noise is actually added at every step of uh, the training and the next one is uh, the mixing of uh, regularizations yeah this is the one i mentioned uh, like uh, a1 and a1 and a2 and a2 the style regularization that changes for every block which doesn't change in the case of a progressively going grand growing gans uh, that is a difference between progressively going gans and uh, uh, and style gans and the word style actually comes the style thing this is this it comes from the mapping network uh okay uh some confessions here so th there are some unexplored portions from this uh, uh thing from this uh, whole slide sl slideshow that is one dc gans uh, i did not explain like why dc gans are different from the original gans i told you that the convolution makes unstable but i didn't tell you why it makes unstable and i mentioned that there are some points at which makes it stable and i didn't give an explanation on why these points make the dc gan stable that is something which i did not explore i tried to explore but uh, i couldn't i'll try to do uh, something of other and in the style gans one thing is bilinear sampling process i did not explain what is bilinear sampling process i just said that the upsampling is replaced by a bilinear upsampling that's it and one thing uh, that which you could see and i did not explain is the structure of mapping network so i am saying that this mapping network actually is eight fully connected layers and it takes noise and it creates some style the vector space for styles but what is uh, like uh, imagine this like you can create a style now so take a noise create eight fully connected layers and get a space but how how does this style actually uh, reflect here 
that I'm not explaining. I, I did not explain. These things, actually, I did not understand. So that's why I mentioned that these things are not explored in this lecture. Uh, in the coming books, uh, book club session, first, I'll try to uh, uh, clear these things before going into the next things, whatever, any, if anybody wants to go to next. Uh, so that is the that is today's uh, session about auto encoders on GANs. Uh, the simple thing uh, to remember is uh, uh, auto encoder two things uh, encoder and decoder. Uh, in a similar manner, GANs two things uh, uh, generator and uh, discriminator. The only thing is that if you are uh, so there are a lot of GANs. If you remember, like uh, uh, Jason pointed out, uh, a chat where there are a lot of GANs. In all of those GANs, the main thing which we are changing is how the generation process uh, differs. Because generation is a black box, uh, we don't know what the, what the generator model actually is doing to generate those images. So we change the generator so that it could make better be better and better images or uh, that application specific images or something of that sort. So, uh, and I did not cover uh, all the different kinds of GANs because mostly the book does not actually uh, talk about all kinds of GANs. It only talks, it only talks about these GANs. So I only explored these things. Uh, that's it. Uh, any more questions now? So the reason why I asked not to ask questions for these things actually is because I know there are some questions that I did not answer and I wanted to point out it here. Okay. Any any questions? I really like the, the game analogy. Like the games are just like a a game between the discriminator and the generator. Oh, Sorry. that actually, uh, I am good fellow. The guy who actually created GANs, he gave the analogy. I was reading the paper and I was uh, saying the video at the same time. So uh, I thought to use the same analogy to make it a bit into two. Yeah, I liked it a lot. Also, I appreciated the normalization explanation. That was really good. Was yeah, really good. Uh, this thing is, uh, it actually, uh, the name is actually uh, a bit cunning in nature, I'd say, because we are not normalizing here. We're actually recreating the normalized ones because this is normalization. We know that this is normalization. This is the usual normalization. Now we are trying to recreate the X from the Y thing. And I don't think it should be called normalization, but they call it adoptive instance normalization. I'm like going with that name for now. Oh. Um, okay. Any other comments? So remember that I'm trying to pick it up. This paper by Jason, um, right? So this is a good time to read this paper, right? This one. So systematic review of guns. Toby's isn't even included here. Um, you know, just to kind of now take in place like what we've learned, and then see what's been done, right? So I think, uh, so you can see the, you know, like whatever we discussed here, I don't think it was style gun, but we know that we're doing some work there, but this is a good time to maybe review this paper, okay? Yeah, no, sure, John. So it's a systematic review of guns for medical image segmentation. Okay. Um, so we have two more chapters. 